second lecture of Sciencia's 2021-22 lecture series. We're delighted you're with us in person on Zoom. I'm Anthony Brand, Professor of Composition and Theory at the Shepherd School of Music and Director of Sciencia. Each year, Sciencia brings together outstanding Rice faculty to examine broad themes that transcend disciplines. This year's series celebrates and explores the vast interconnectedness that animates nature and human life. Tonight, we're honored to present Professors John Sparagana and William Parsons. John Sparagana is Grace Christian Vietti Chair in the Visual Arts at Rice University. His work has been shown internationally, most recently with exhibitions in Los Angeles, Berlin, Chicago, Houston, New York, and Zurich. He is the author with Mieka Bal of Sleeping Beauty, a One Artist Dictionary, University of Chicago Press, and with Rito Geiser, Reading Revolutionaries. On the occasion of his solo exhibition, Shatter, Corbett versus Dempsey published the monograph John Sparagama, covering five series completed between 2016 and 2019. His exhibition, Projectile, opens at Soccer Club in Chicago on November 12th, so just in a few days. He'll present a solo exhibition at Houston's Sicardi Ayers Pacino Gallery this coming April. William Parsons is Professor of Religion at Rice University. He holds a BA from Brandeis University and a PhD from University of Chicago. He has written and edited 11 books, including Teaching Mysticism, Oxford Press, and Being Spiritual But Not Religious, Past, Present, Futures. He has served as Chair of the Department of Religion at Rice, as Director of the Humanities Research Center, and been a Fellow at the Martin Marty Center of the University of Chicago and at the Institute for Advanced Studies at Hebrew University. Each of our guests will speak for about 20 to 25 minutes, and then at the end we'll have 10 minutes for questions and invite you very cordially to a reception in the lobby. Please join me in welcoming Professor John Spergat. Thanks, Tony. Hi, everybody. I'm going to read. past 20 years, my work has utilized images from popular media, news, fashion, comics, materially breaking down and restructuring result in pieces that carry the DNA of the source media image yet shift their informational mode. Images with the intention of triggering an immediate and directed response to a sensual, sensual poetic, ambiguous, indeterminate mode in artwork. Let's see, how do we... Adriana, are you close by? Oh, there we go, okay. So I'll, I'll just I'll show you, come on. I want to bring up this image. Just, we'll just go with general school. Yeah. Okay. So um, I've got a couple. Some up there. Yeah. Uh, there's one, and how about um, yeah. I'm not used to a mouse. Okay, so uh, that one is, you can see, uses comics, Dick Tracy comics. Um, okay. Uh, in representing the, the work photographically, much of the perceptual complexity, materiality, and sensuality of these artworks is lost. The resulting representation is a normalization of the work 
such that it loses its impact and unfortunately to a significant extent its meaning. Ideally the works would exclusively be viewed in person, but in fact much of one's audience views the works primarily, if not exclusively, via photographic reproduction, digitally online, or in books and catalogs, or in a very compromised situation on the screen. <laughs> So we're looking at uh, this one right now. Uh, uh, this uh, revolutionary piece is from uh, 2014 exhibition, Crowds and Powder. Um, in that catalog, we responded to this confounding limitation by reproducing each piece in the series three times, first in its entirety, then in detail, zoomed in, and then zoomed closer in. Magnifying details shifts focus to materiality and methodology of construction, pointing toward the transformation that takes place in the actual piece. So, here's the entire piece, zoomed in, and further zoomed in. When Rice Professor of Architecture, Rado Geyser, Rado, uh, and I decided to collaborate on a book project. Rado had the idea of a wonderfully absurd ramping up of the crowds and powder catalog strategy to a literal representation of one of the pieces in that series, an eight foot by five foot artwork, artwork titled The Revolutionaries, via sequential rip reproduction over the course of a 180 page pulp paperback novel. novel. The page is represented in black and white sequentially, top left to bottom right, on a one-to-one -one scale, the crowds and powder artwork, the revolutionaries. Uh, so you're seeing some images here, kind of not quite in order, um, but you see uh, pages with each, each one of these pages, 180 pages, is a one-to-one -one representation of a fragment of the overall field-based uh, painting-like piece. Uh, each page is, a meaning, is meaningless as a key to the overall image, and so becomes an amplification of conditions not discernible in the reproduction of the overall artwork. The book includes a graphic index of the artwork with each page's corresponding location. It's right here, at the back of the book. Um, the book was both a strategy of literal representation of an artwork and its own artwork, a transformation of form from what is essentially a large-scale painting to a paperback novel. The title of the book, Reading Revolutionaries, Rado's Invention, references the sly translation of a field-based artwork into an absurdist literal read. It's a weird, amusing, lovely, and unique object and project satisfying collaboration. So uh, here's Rado with a book in hand in front of the actual piece. You can see the, uh, the side of the, the novel um, with uh, the edges of each page. And here's a lovely stack of reading revolutionaries. See, I want to get back to your email. Thanks, John. Yeah, that'll work. In 2017, musician, poet, and Brooklyn College professor David Grubbs contacted me about making a cover for his Duke University Press book now that the audience is assembled. The book-length prose poem explores, deeply delves into the shifting relationship between imp an improvising musician, audience, and the performance space over the course of a performance. David was aware of my books, uh, my series involving crowds, and he proposed that I make a piece to be utilized as the book's cover, based on an image of a black and white news photo from a 1985 riot at a rock and roll stadium concert. 
The photo is a remarkable tableau of uh, the, the stadium, Mei Li. As I made a piece, then another, further possibilities of image and methodology of deconstruction and organization continue to arise, leading ultimately to a 25-piece series. It was one of those in-the-zone experiences, a series of 25 artworks fashioned by hand, each taking dozens of hours, arising from a news photo of a single moment taken in a split second. Along with the series generated, I proposed a book collaboration with Rado and David. David's text, images from my pieces, Rado's graphic design. The resulting book, once again, takes the form of a pulp paperback novel, second in, second in uh, what I imagine to be a series, a sibling to the first seven years later, yet entirely different in approach. Rado's design strategy involved weaving through a sequence of image fragments from my pieces, David's text, a narrative via a long unfolding single sentence of conditions and events leading up to the moment of crowd frenzy. The first chair thrown, the camera shutter snapped. The resulting book, itself a sort of an artwork, could not have been realized without the perfect stew of our particular individual contributions, the collaboration. The title of the book, as well as the series, as well as the upcoming uh, exhibition this Friday, is Projectile. Um, and here you're seeing uh, some of the uh, pages from the book, the double spreads of the book, and you, you can see how the text is woven in in um, various ways. It's, it's a really lo lovely rhythm um, to the book. I think the book's about 220 pages. I want to just show you the cover, because the cover is pretty fantastic. Let's see. Yeah, can you get me back? I teach studio-based classes, and I, and I don't like to show images on the screen, so... Yeah, yeah, that's good. So, I'm, uh, I apologize for my uh, fumbling with this. Uh, so, here is the... Uh, cover, front and back, some more of the images, pages with the text mixed in. So finally, I, I want to mention that my interest in speaking today is in acknowledging the mystery of, creative, of collaborative creative process, how transformative works are generated through collaboration. One may trace the steps, analyze the role that each member of the collaboration played, recognize the sparks in the process, but at core, how ideas arise remains mysterious. Thank you. So it must be something, but it, is it clear-cut and easy to identify? Or is it more like what Gertrude Stein once said about Oakland, California, namely, there is no there there? It's a good question. So let's start with the easy. We can say what it is not. It does not refer to those who have definitively settled in a particular institutionally based religious tradition, are happy with its ethical and metaphysical postulates and are consistent in observing its services and rituals. If this is the case, 
then it would suggest that being SBNR refers to those who are not wedded to a particular tradition. Those who are disillusioned with traditional institutional religion, yet may also feel that those same traditions contain deep wisdom about the human condition. To say I'm spiritual but not religious would then indicate that a person seeks to integrate that religious wisdom without fully committing to what is perceived to be the false trappings and mendacity of religious accoutrements of all kinds, i.e. dogma, ideologies, rituals, hierarchies, etc. At the same time, befitting spiritual shoppers in a consumer age, it also speaks to those who canvass multiple religious traditions, mining their spiritual wisdom and introspective introspective techniques for the juice of peak experience in order to foster a spiritual journey tailored to their individual needs. This general portrait has been detailed a bit more in contemporary academic literature. To note some pertin pertinent takeaways from that literature, those who profess to be SDNR contest any claim to absolute authority and point with regard to traditional institutional forms of religion to their historical role in perpetuating unfair forms of economic, social, and political power. Those who profess to being SBNR also tend to valorize individualism, free creative choice, and expression, egalitarianism, a psychological therapeutic approach to spiritual growth, and a seeker mentality. They are more apt to see humans as basically good, or more liable to participate in multiple, diverse, yet entangled institutional forms. Think the local Young Institute, the local Zen Center, and yes, even the Catholic Mass. They are, on the whole, likely to proclaim a vague pantheism and outlook, affirm a liberative, if undefined, ethic, and are more likely than not to affirm the possibility of reincarnation. Still others see being SBNR as valorizing a new set of institutions, the therapeutic clinic, the theater, the university, Rothko Chapel, the UN, retreat centers of all kinds. A 2015 study by the Pew Research Center concluded that being SBNR maps across multiple segments of the American population, noting that this change is taking place, and here I quote, across the religious landscape, affecting all regions of the country and many demographic groups. While the drop in Christian affiliation is particularly pronounced among young adults, it is occurring among Americans of all ages. The same trends are seen among whites, blacks, and Latinas, among both college graduates and adults with only a high school education and among women as well as men. So this emerging portrait of being SBNR has also given rise to a variety of depictions of who and what they are in popular media outlets. For example, one could point to the dissolution character played by Laura Dern in the HBO series Enlightened, a character who spends 50,000 bucks on a Hawaii New Age retreat where she meditates, practices yoga, undergoes therapy, achieves a level of enlightenment, then returns to her corporate job in an effort to change her friends, family, and the world is a popular illustration of what we might mean by being SBNR. Alternately, fans of the television series Mad Men might recall the final episode where Don Draper, on retreat at that famous California center known as Esalen, which, by the way, has been framed as proclaiming the religion of no religion, comes up with a new advertising jingle, which is to say, I'd like to buy the world a Coke. A jingle that, in real life, was recorded by a group known as the New Seekers, the underlying meaning of its lyrics being to bring love and harmony to the inhabitants of the earth, or to go to the farthest, unflattering extreme. One might view a recent YouTube video found by Googling the church for people who are as spiritual but not religious that unabashedly parodies the SBNR as narcissistic and vacuous. And it so happens that I, I have that video. So I'm going to show it to you. It's about three minutes. Yeah. But tell me that when you look at a sun 
It connects us, binds us together, and it's vibrating and stuff. You know what I mean? I get it. Now, everyone open your Twitter feeds to at Deepak Chopra. Our innermost awareness is a portal to divinity. That is so vague, but I know exactly what he means. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'd like to read a passage from the mall scan. I write ideas. What if God isn't a he? What if he is a she or a deer? Hear me out. I was at a music fest. I was outside taking a piss. And this deer walks up. And we make intimate eye contact. And he just started pissing. He was pissing as soon as I was pissing. It was one of the most spiritual things that I've ever experienced. And I like this in remembrance of the first time that I did mushrooms. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you for sharing with us everything you remember from your liberal arts. Take it away, Melissa! I don't believe in hell and heaven. I'm on the fence about reincarnation. Uh, Thank you for joining me today. It is so nice to talk to intelligent individuals who can rationally see that science hasn't figured it all out. Yeah. Now that you'll all open your meditation apps on your phone, set it to 15 minutes. But first, let's all give each other a hug and let the physics of love clean your chakras. Oh, those are some good hugs. Oh, what a nice hug over here. You two hug back there. Oh, yeah. Now that's a good fucking hug. Thanks for watching. Click here to subscribe. Click here for more videos. Or don't click at all. I don't give a fuck. Okay, <laughs> that's a nice commentary. Okay, so at any rate, that was a one-sided video. And being one-sided, that video demands that we resort to that time-honored scholarly dance, the qualification. The example just given links being SBNR to neoliberal capitalism, pop media, and its consumer culture. The perspective best seen in a book by Jeremy Carrick titled Selling Spirituality. But some scholars, notably Lee Schmidt in his book Restless Souls, reminds us that being SBNR has taken many forms, ranging back well over a century to the creative self-expression, rugged individualism, and social activism of early New England transcendentalists like Emerson, Sarah Farmer, Thoreau, and Walt Whitman. Walt Whitman. Again, ethnographic studies such as those tallied by Linda Mercadante in her book Believe Beyond, Beyond Borders reveal that those who profess to being SBNR have a spectrum of allegiance to organized institutional religion, ranging from those completely divorced from the latter to those who have maintained a certain degree of commitment to them, even to the extent of making a traditional religion their major home, but integrating multiple other religious practices and ideation to fit their needs for spiritual individuation. In other words, being SBNR sometimes shades into being spiritual and religious. It seems that being SBNR is not a cut and dry phenomenon but consists of shades of gray, which suggests that we need more ethnographic studies as well as multiple analyses concerning what constitutes being SBNR. In other words, whatever one might initially think being SBNR is, I can tell you that you are partially right, but also partially, as Humphrey Bogart once said in Casablanca, misinformed. And so being misinformed, we can say more. One of the ways to go about getting to know that more is to go back into history when it started and how it developed. Let's start with we, what we in the trade call genealogies. The historical drift is from a form of spirituality defined relative to church and tradition. Let's call this classic spirituality. To a form divorced from church and tradition, let's call this modern spirituality. For example, in the letters of St. Paul, we find him speaking of spirituals, a term he used to signify those individuals whose mind, will, and heart were ordered and led by the spirit over against those egotistically attached to and led by the things of the world. While through the centuries spirituality carried alternate meanings, 
at one point actually being used in a juridical sense to denote ecclesiastical offices and property. Today, the church sense of spirituality refers to the aims and goals, practices and virtues of believers defined relative to the totality of a church religious matrix. Think Teresa of Avila or St. John of the Cross. But modern spirituality took a slightly different course. As many scholars have cataloged, it was those pesky liberal religious traditions, transcendentalists, Unitarians, Quakers, their values, individuality, solitude, inner silence and meditation, ethical reforms, creative self-expression, appreciation of religious variety, and their consummate figures, Emerson, Walt Whitman, Thoreau, Howard Thurman, Rufus Jones, Mark Fuller, Sarah Farmer, who produced through a variety of cultural mechanisms a specifically American version of spirituality. Walt Whitman, Walt Whitman speaks to this shift when he observes that the spirituality of religion would issue forth only in the perfect uncontamination and solitariness of individuality, an utterance that signaled the move to an unchurched, non-traditional, and even anti-institutional orientation towards the law. Going forward in time, one of the very first references to SBNR was in 1926 in a journal called The American Mercury, where the then president of the Rotary Club of all things described his organization as inclusive, non-sectarian, and notably as spiritual but not religious. That was mirrored in 1934 in all places, the Washington Post, an article about the Great Lusitania Shipwreck, an article that described various models for memorializing their lives lost as spiritual but not religious. And while other snippets like these can be found littered in magazines and journals as the force of the therapeutic system, that of Bob Wilson and his 12th step AA program, which he and others described repeatedly in the 50s to the 70s as being spiritual but not religious, that became the major force behind the popular dissemination of the term. And so it is that we get Ellen Burstyn's character in the 1980 movie Resurrection, a character who has a near-death experience and subsequently gains paranormal powers, being described as spiritual but not religious. And in 1985, Norman Lear, of all people, described himself as the spiritual but not religious Jew. And again, in the 1989 LA Times Personals ad, a woman described herself as a lovely Eurasian woman, spiritual but not religious, believes love is the highest expression of the human experience. When in 1999, the moniker was taken up by the Gallup poll, becoming one of three options for describing one's beliefs, religious, SBNR, or neither, with 30% choosing SBNR. The die was cast. SBNR was here to stay. Surely there are many other forces that added me to this skeletal historical frame. Well, we are looking for those cultural strands that might cause not just a few individuals, but whole groups of them to become suspicious of and to withdraw from the traditional ways in which institutional religion asks us to demonstrate our commitment to the divine. Existing studies have pointed to a number of such strands and conditions that have colluded to form the contemporary option of being SBNR. Selling points include the role of neoliberal capitalism, of democracy and pluralism, particularly the role of Eastern religions, the Western religious past, if I said, as I've already said, the role of Protestant thought, and the cultural influence of science and psychological modes of introspection. Complicit with these factors is the American stress on individualism and pragmatism, the rise of the secularized consciousness, and the separation of church and state. And one can say so much more. Think of the decade of the 1960s with this focus on what is known as the death of God theology, the ingestion of mind-altering substances like LSD, the role of queer and racially marginalized communities, the growing awareness of institutional religion was all too much in bed with politicians' capitalist and vested interests, hence helping to maintain its evident structural racism, repressed sexualities, and gender biases. There is much here to investigate, and all of it has caused many to cast a skeptical glance toward divine commands of any kind. So in trying to answer the question what cultural forces colluded to make up the SBNR, the answer is that it's complicated the incomplete list that I just presented would further have to admit that any attempt at cultural analysis seeking to track any social historical manifestation, such as the SBNR, must do away with the concept of cause in favor of a Weberian elective affinity itself being complicated, not only because of the degree of difficulty involved in isolating and naming such strains, but also because of the degree of impossibility involved in tracking how they morph in their interaction. Finally, since we have inquired about the past origins and development of the SBNR, as well as some of its present expressions, we can end by asking about its future. Whether the SBNR, will it continue to flourish, or will it die on the vine, like so many other religious movements? If it continues to grow, what will it look like? Here's where the scholar puts on a second cap out of the public intellectual. If being SBNR is somewhat nebulous, can we step in and help form it? Well, one thing for sure, scholars have been quite active in pointing out what is wrong with it. And once that is on the books, we have to be some basis for, for, for suggesting how to write it. But as has been said, the devil is in the details, and it's not quite so simple. 
scholars seem to love to disagree with respect to the wrong and the right of the SVNR, there's been a fair amount of debate. Again, to offer a brief incomplete survey, studies have brought up a number of concerns, including charges that have fostered spiritual narcissism, the lack of community and insipid perennialism, a superficial consumerism, an unarticulated ethic and metaphysic, a disjointed connection to the past and idiosyncratic eclecticism, and seeming ignorance of the need for social activism. Questions abound concerning its viability, sustainability, and future relation to organized religion. So again, whether the SBNR. An answer to this, just as with its past and present forms, is, is difficult. What one can say is that its course will be in part determined by the social soil of the future. In that sense, its future is like a train without tracks. It is we who will collectively till the ground on which the tracks will be laid. Ending then with that note of mystery, I uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you both. And now uh, we'll take questions both from the audience and online. You're invited to put questions in the chat. Does anyone want to start us off? John, let me start with a question. How do you pick your images? Is it for their content or is it for something about the visual quality of them? What goes into that original choice? Because that's so decisive then and what happens? It varies. In a, in a certain sense, um, any, any image from popular media, um, take, take a news image, for example, the different series that I've done with news images, um, just the fact that it is a news image and that I've interacted with it and shifted its terms from those informational, pragmatic, to some extent maybe pro propagandistic terms to, um, you know, op open it up into something uh, more am ambiguous and open-ended and, um, you know, uh, uh, shift the, the visual nature, that transformation is what I'm most interested in, but in some cases it's, uh, you know, the, the nature of the image itself is also important. For instance, the one that I worked on, worked with for the entire series, this riot in a rock and roll stadium. Um, or uh, I, I used an image of Bobby Kennedy's funeral, uh, his family, uh, out front of the, the house um, uh, in Hyannisport, um, lovely image in 2009 when uh, uh, Teddy, sorry, Teddy Kennedy's funeral. Um, I mixed that with um, an Andy Warhol um, image of flowers from 1964, uh, which was uh, visually uh, interesting and dynamic, but also, uh, you know, evoked um, that moment um, in the early 60s when, when uh, Teddy Kennedy's brother, John, was murdered. Yeah. Dr. Parsons, you said that, um, I believe you said that this is a uniquely, or maybe primarily American form of identity. Is there much knowledge about how progressive it is in other European countries or other Russian countries or non Russian countries? Uh, it, it flourishes best in democratic countries. So uh, when I was in Israel, actually, there was a fairly strong SBNR movement there. Uh, and in England, um, Lane Eklund actually wrote a paper about this with her cohort Didi. Um, and that was about how these terms really have different meanings in different cultures. And so a lot more ethnographic work needs to be done to sort of suss that out. Um, I, I think it's fair to say, I don't know if Lane will agree with me here, that it's primarily a Western phenomenon and in the big democratic countries. And um, I just got a, a book manuscript about someone who's doing this in Italy, looking at the SBR in Italy. So, um, so certainly a lot of the European countries, I would venture a guess, aside from England you, and, uh, and Italy, Middle Eastern countries like Israel, democracy. Uh, the United States, Canada, um, that this would be, you know, growing in scope. But I would also venture to guess that probably not in Russia or China. Uh, 
Um, if, if so, there's undergrad. Actually, I just remember that a former graduate student of ours who is a Sufi, who has a job here in the States, but he grew up in Iran. There are underground SBNR currents in Iran. Obviously, they cannot be above ground. But he was actually going to write about this, but then he realized that he still has family left in Iran, and that might be the end of them, so he didn't. But he's actually tracking this, so there's probably some of that going on as well. That's the best I can do. Like, do you want to add anything to that? Okay, Lynn does not want to add anything to that. I did not pay her enough to have her. I will pay her more next time. John, if I may, and one for, for Bill. Are we allowed to ask questions of both speakers when I feel Okay, thanks. Um, you ended, uh, John, a really a neat, I can't, I don't know if I'm going to get it right, but you said something like um, the kind of connection that leads to collaboration is mysterious. Um, and I wonder if you could reflect with us on the conditions that lead to that willingness to enter into that mystery. So it seems to me that, that collaborating across disciplines or collaborating in any way indeed is a mysterious endeavor, but how do we create the conditions um, where that mystery flourishes? You know, I, for me it was a more general um, kind of reflection on creative process. You know, how do, how do these things arise? So, there's so much that you, you could identify, but in fact, how, you know, how do certain decisions um, arise, uh, you know, in the course of, of doing one's own work as, as well as collaboration? But, uh, you know, I think uh, that there is, uh, you know, I'm a studio-based artists, you know, so it's a, it's a solo uh, kind of occupation and it's, um, there's, there's, a, there's a kind of an energy that, <laughs> that results from interacting with other, you know, other people, other minds, other talents and it's, it's, uh, it's very cool to see something emerge that uh, has, has something to do with, you know, with your own practice but that uh, takes it somewhere else um, than you could have imagined going, and there's also a, a fellowship in it that's that's really lovely. Oh, that's, that's a really neat response. Thank you, thank you. And Bill, I was wondering, um, as you know, I'm a huge fan of your work, and I was wondering, and when you are thinking about the genealogy of the spiritual but not religious, what is the connection in your mind to institutionalized? religion. So, you and I have talked about this, but I'd just love to hear you reflect more. So the video clip that, that, you, sh that you showed, which was terribly funny, um, but you know, there were like five different religious traditions um, uh, mentioned, and you know, as I studied uh, spiritual but not religious in the scientific community, I've gotten reviews on articles and reviewers say things like, this is not a real phenomenon, it's something that's in response to a particular form of religious religion, so it's a Christian spiritual but not religious, or when we study this in the Indian context, it's a Hindu spiritual but not religious, a kind of responsiveness to a particular form of institutionalized religion. So, uh, I mean, th those are clearly also the case, but what happened was back in 2000, and, I think it was 18 or 17, we had this conference. you remember what year that was? Because you were in it, but I, I can't remember that far back, because of, you know, the mind. Um, <laughs> But anyway, we have this a big conference here at Rice on spiritual but not religious. And we brought, uh, what I did was I just sussed out other people who had written on this topic and I just brought them down. <laughs> and I just, I just, I found it to be interesting. I was just interested in myself because I just finished a book on Augustine of all people. And I was sort of tracking words like mysticism, which have a whole history and a whole series of debates through the genealogy of that term, spirituality. And I had the good fortune of bringing two first-rate historians of the American religious tradition, Lee Schmidt, who's at Washington U, and uh, Matt Hedstrom, who's at UVA. And they now have a series on American spirituality with the UVA Press. And when I was trying to uh, sort of gin up the introduction for this, this edited volume, um, I contacted them first off. And I said, you know, I, I, this, in order to put all this together, we have to have some kind of historical frame. 
And so what they did was they, you know, have all these sort of weird ways of tracking down terms that, that you know, that historians do, and people like me don't. I'm more a psychologist than anything else. So, but I learned a lot from the way that sort of they tracked it. And what they found was that this is kind of a Western, but also a very American tradition that's not really, you know, altogether associated with Christianity. You know, and I, I you know, if, if you, in, in my talk, I talked about the 1926. This is actually the first reference to spiritual and religious that we could find. 1926 in the American Mercury, and it was the president of the Rotary Club. Now, that makes a certain amount of sense because they want business and they want business from anybody, right? So, spiritual but not religious sort of sounds very generic, and so it's, it's accommodating to everybody. But then, and it also got into newspapers, and then AA, of course, is the same kind of a thing. So, you might say those are sort of deracinated or disillusioned products of people who, you know, don't want to be in the Christian tradition. I suppose you could say that. But I, 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 would, I, would, I would say also that there seems to be an American focus to this, and so you go to the American metaphysical tradition. Now, how all of that combines together, this is also what I said, kind of techno-speak, which I'm sure no one here at any idea was talking about, and I knew it's probably going to fly about the his head, but I refer to it, they bear an elective affinity. So it's, you know, this notion of cultural strands, you just pointed out two, I just pointed out a third. So cultural strands, and when I teach this, I give the analogy of a blender. You know, I wake up in the morning, and what happened in my smoothie? If you had picked a party, you'd probably see this banana in there, there's OJ, there's some blueberries, there's, you know, muscle powder a little bit of crack cocaine, but that's you know, just to get me started in the morning. So you put all that stuff, it really works with my students, but this crowd, no. That's just, so, uh, but it was, you know, but those are cultural strands just to make it, you know, easy. But the way they go in, and they morph together, and they, you get a new product, right? So that's kind of what they bear in elective affinity is. There's not like one cause, it's like all of these strands. I think that's true of SBNR as well. So I think we have to be very careful about just talking about one aspect or one cause or, I don't think it's, I think it's really complicated. And as for where it's going to go, I think that's also really complicated. And I do think the scholars will have at least something to say about where it's going to go. So, but we'll see. I don't know. I probably just think that the, the, the nomenclature is just going to drop out. You know, and, and they say there, there's another nomenclature coming up, the nuns. And my response is, really? The nuns? I mean, too many people have had bad experiences in third grade. That's not going to, you know, continue. It's not going to So, um, so okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, hi. My question is directed towards Dr. Life uh, of people who really want to express themselves. All the discontent that never represses some kind of a, That, I think, is absolutely a unifier. Uh, another unifier is, I think, part of the capitalist culture, which is consumer ish. And so we like new ideas, and it doesn't really matter, you know, what religious tradition, we'll pick and choose whatever we want. So if I go to HB, HEB, you go to H, HEB, I'm sure you'd be getting the organic carrots and the cabbage and stuff, and I'd be getting the hot fudge and the chocolate, which is what I always get there because the hot fudge is so good. But it would be very different, right? But we're shopping, you know, the market is the same. So that would certainly be, uh, you know, a, a, a second thing. Um, so, other than those two, I'm having a hard time just off the top of my head coming up with another really important one. But in a capitalistic culture that prizes individuality and free choice, it, it's a pretty good bet that that kind of thing is going to stick around, particularly with people who want to express themselves, they're going to get inner discontents and, and be, be you know, authorized to do so. Uh, there are probably other things that will you know, uh, make this uh, work, even more like social media. Right, because everybody gets to say at that point. So that, that kind of self-expression is sort of going to stay out there. But you know, that's also why it, it may lead to a backlash. So uh, if it's just, it, it can be very narcissistic in that way. And there's a, you know, I mentioned Jerry, Jeremy Carrot's book, Selling Spirituality. And if it gets to that, then that, that's problematic. And I have friends on all ends of the spectrum, you know, people who are, I consider to be mostly narcissistic, but others who are very, very thoughtful very individualistic, very critical of traditional religion, but also very firm in their own desire for their own spirituality. So I, I think it's a very complicated, you know, phenomenon. So, Len, do you, do you have any more comments about the common stuff? Another question? I 
I've always been kind of fascinated by the Second Great Awakening movement um, in the early 1800s, which I thought was always a product of another set of uniquely American circumstances. Um, and I'm curious to know if you see any parallels between the rise of SBNR and the rise of some of the groups that came out of that Second Great Awakening movement, and if that can maybe present a roadmap for what might be ahead. Another great question. Uh, I, I'm a uh, I don't know. I mean, to say that means that I would have to search out commonalities between that time era and our time era in order to make that kind of a comparison. That would be rather difficult for me to do, especially on the spot, but I'm kind of reluctant to do that because I think conditions have changed so much. What I can say is that there do seem to be some commonalities uh, in the sense that uh, you know every religious tradition uh, always has schisms and developments and backlashes. In fact, the nature of religion is that. People like to think, oh, there's some sort of foundational this, or foundational Christianity, or foundational Islam. That's just not true at all, historically. I mean, you get a founder, and then, you know, the charismatic Vivere and Sesson, they come out with some truths, and then immediately gets routinized. And once it gets routinized to the church and temples and mosques or whatever, then there's going to be a back backlash, and you're going to get division. So that's always going to happen. Uh, but, it, but if I could actually... Uh, prognosticate about conditions that led to the Great Awakening, Second Great Awakening, and, and the SBNR. Uh, I might be able to also prophesize about what's going to happen in the future, and I know I can't do that. So again, like uh, this other question over here, it's, it's a similar kind of question, right? And I'm just as a scholar, I'm really reluctant to do that. You know, I'm a footnote guy. I, I like to spend hours in Fondren just looking for footnotes. And uh, it's true, I've been to the hospital many times, I've passed out the phone with that, and shoot me off, but you know, that's just me. And my dean is like, like thinking, thinking to yourself is, my goodness, this, this poor guy who's always in the hospital, but he's doing his duty. You know, so that's the best I can do with that, that question. So, as people shake their heads. Any other questions? Oh, yes. Yeah, great. And I think we'll make this the last question and then we'll have our reception. So the question says, do you think SBNR comes from, comes more from being disillusioned by organized religions or more trying to meld various thoughts and ideas to make sense for oneself and create a more enlightened path? I didn't get the second part. What's the second part? I'll, re I'll reread it. <laughs> John's going to answer this question, by the way. Uh, <laughs> really lonely. It, no. says, uh, it says, do you think SBNR comes more from being disillusioned by organized religions or more trying to meld various thoughts and ideas to make sense? I see. I get it. Okay, okay. So... There's actually a theory about this, which I'm going to pair it back to you. It's a psychosocial theory. But the idea is that those two parts are uh, inexorably aligned. That, that disillusionment, which usually comes when you're in a religious tradition, you idealize its figures, you idealize its scriptures, you idealize its ideas and the people in it. But if they disappoint you in some horrific way, and it can be a real blow, right? Then you become immediately disillusioned. They weren't what you thought they were. And so you're cast out. But that disillusionment has, gives rise to another process, which is the creative response. And in this case, the creative response would be the generation of new ideas, you know, searching everywhere to create the, you know, in the vacuum that was left by a religious tradition and, and the idealization of it, uh, a substitute. It's almost like a natural human process where you have to respond to that. So uh, that, that, that's a theory of what they call mourning. M O U R N I N G, not M O R N, not evening. It's, it's, it's a theory of mourning. So it's not just a loved one that is lost. It could be an abstract ideal or, uh, or faith tradition. And when that happens, then you're bereft of that structure. And as a human being, you have to respond in some kind of a way. So it's almost as if that has to happen. Unless there's repression somewhere. But in our open culture, pluralism and uh, capitalism and individualism, then that's naturally going to happen. So that's the way I'm answering it.
you both for wonderful presentations and thank you for the great discussion afterwards.